open up to the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 begins uh, what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is almost certainly the most well-known sermon Jesus ever preached. And the first 12 verses are known as the Beatitudes. And that's the title of this morning's message, the Beatitudes. And before we begin reading, the word beatitude means an exalted state of blessing. So keep that in mind as we begin Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you." So this basically makes up the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. And I'd like to make a few comments about the Sermon on the Mount because it has been interpreted differently by uh, many groups over the centuries. For example, the medieval church believed that the Sermon on the Mount represented a higher ethic directed mainly at clergy. In more modern times, uh, some dispensationalists have seen Jesus as speaking only to the Jews, so this really isn't uh, meant for New Testament Christians. This is just about the Jews in the coming millennial kingdom. And then many of the old mainline Protestant denominations have seen the Sermon on the Mount as basically being uh, what is called the social gospel. Uh, the liberal mainline denominations uh, generally speaking, they don't think that the true meaning of Christ was to come into the world to die uh, as an atonement for sin and rise again to offer salvation and eternal life. They believe the uh, mission of Christ was to come and to teach people how to love and accept everybody and to uh, minister to the poor. Well, I think all three positions, while there may be a point or two to be made, uh, I think all three miss the mark. The primary intent of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount is to expound upon the deeper implications of the Mosaic law. Of course, Jesus was talking to Jewish people. There's no question about that. But the Jews, the problem with the Jews in the first century, they thought that salvation and their inheritance in the kingdom was, uh, it belonged to them basically for two reasons. Number one, they were descendants of Abraham. And then number two, they really believed they were keeping the law. And what Jesus is trying to do, he's trying to get them to realize their need for repentance and grace. And that they were misunderstanding the true intent of the law. That nobody was able to truly keep it. So what is the purpose of the law of God? Well, the purpose of the law, according to the Bible, is to reveal to a person that they are a sinner who has fallen short of the glory of God. And because all have fallen short, all are in need of God's grace, which is given through Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56, he said, the strength of sin is the law. And in Galatians 3, 24, he said, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified 
by faith. So in the Sermon on the Mount, what we see is an impossible standard. And because it is impossible and because we have all fallen short, it shows us our need for repentance and God's grace. And then once a person realizes that and they place their faith in Christ, then God gives them a new heart. That heart of stone is removed. A heart of flesh is put in. And then with the aid of the Spirit of God, a person is able to live as Christ would have them to live. So let's go through these verses a little more closely. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. So this is where some will question, okay, is Jesus speaking to the multitude? Because it looks like here he's just talking to his 12 disciples. Well, here's the thing. Even if Jesus is only speaking to the 12, now under the new covenant, all men are commanded to repent and believe the gospel. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. And all who believe are to become followers of of Christ, Matthew 28, verse 19. And what is a follower? Uh, a follower of Christ is a learner, a disciple. Okay? So to say that this is only for the 12 disciples, therefore it's only for ordained clergy, or it's only for the super committed followers of Christ, yeah, you're on shaky ground uh, to say the least, if you think that. But look at verse 2. It says, He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And just a side note, the term kingdom of heaven, uh, basically it is synonymous with the term kingdom of God. If you compare the Gospels, you will see that. Uh, kingdom of heaven is unique to the gospel of Matthew. Matthew was directed more at a Jewish audience. The Jews uh, were reluctant to use God's name or to write God's name when it wasn't necessary. So to uh, appeal to Jewish sensibilities, uh, Matthew, instead of calling it the kingdom of God, he calls it the kingdom of heaven. So verse 2, then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now this first statement, blessed are the poor in spirit. This is very interesting because in Luke chapter 6, Jesus preaches a variation of the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew 5 is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Luke 6 could be called the Sermon on the Plain. Uh, that is, it was a flat plain, a, a level piece of ground in Matthew, uh, excuse me, in Luke 6. And in Luke 6, Jesus doesn't say, blessed are the poor in spirit. He says, blessed are you poor. So what is Jesus talking about? So if you compare the two and look at the next statements from Christ, blessed are those who mourn and blessed are the meek, Jesus is not speaking about poverty. That is, he is not speaking in the sense of a, a lack of material wealth. Jesus is speaking about spiritual poverty. The poor in spirit, they mourn. And yes, of course, many of them were poor, but it's more than that. They were outcasts. Uh, they were low in spirit. These were the people that society didn't care about. And such an existence is described by our Lord in Matthew 25, verses 42 and 43, when he spoke about the least of these. And what did he say? He said, For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. And he calls them the least of these, my brethren. Now listen, it's true, we should reach out to all people, but there are some who need special attention. Uh, we should not show partiality to one group over another, that is true, but there are people who need some special care. And it is the duty of the Christian to weep with those who weep and to comfort the brokenhearted. And you know, the, the way things are today, 
Sometimes people lose sight of that. The way things are today, things are so polarized that people are all in on one side or the other tends to be the, the way it goes. And it's, it's easy to get too focused on, on one thing. For example, we could be so focused on sound doctrine that we forget mercy. And then there are people that are so concerned with mercy and good works, well, they don't care about doctrine. So we need balance. The mature Christian life should be a life of balance. Uh, Jesus was a strong man. Uh, he gave hard sayings. He reproved people. Uh, he turned over the tables of the money changers and drove them out of the temple with a, a whip of cords. That's true, but Jesus wasn't always like that, especially that last uh, incident. Jesus was also gentle. He was kind. There was a balance. At times he was soft. At times he was very hard. So... There is a, a balance. Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 20, the scripture says about him, uh, a bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. Uh, I'd like to read this uh, comment by Dr. John MacArthur. He said, these people, that is the bruised reed that he will not break, and the smoking flax that he will not quench, these people, uh, these are the people that are deemed useless by the world. Christ's work was to restore and rekindle such people and not to break them or quench them. This speaks of his tender compassion toward the lowliest of the lost. And he came not to gather the strong for a revolution, rather to show mercy to the weak. My friends, the teachings of Christ, they go against the grain. When Jesus appeared on the scene, that's what they wanted. They wanted a king. They wanted a man who would lead a revolution. That's not what he came to do. Instead, he taught things that were counterintuitive. They went against the grain. Just a few examples of this. Jesus said, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will find it. Jesus taught that if you want to be exalted, you must first do what? You must humble yourself. We cannot be first unless we make ourselves last. And then the Apostle Paul uh, taught things like when we are weak, then are we strong. So before a person can be saved, they must first acknowledge they are lost and then be brought low by the conviction of of God the Holy Spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. In Luke 6, he says, Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. And this weeping and this mourning is the mourning that a person faces when they are brought low, when they have a godly sorrow over sin. The, the sorrow of the world is, hey, I'm sorry I got caught. <laughs> but the sorrow of God is a genuine sorrow over sin that we have offended a holy and righteous God. Then and only then can a person be comforted by the grace of God in salvation. And part of salvation is the future resurrection. When Christ returns, the dead will be raised and they will enter into the kingdom, which Revelation chapter 20 tells us uh, lasts for 1,000 years. And that is what I believe Jesus is referring to next here in verse 5 when he says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And when God's people do inherit the earth during the millennial reign of Christ, that will be a time of exaltation and rejoicing, a golden age of righteousness. So those who hunger and thirst for it now, they will be filled. But you need to hunger and thirst for it now. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This is a word that Christians don't even use anymore because when someone hears the word righteousness, what do they think? 
They think self-righteousness. That's not what we're talking about. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And isn't that what God's people are hungering and thirsting for now? If not, there's something wrong. We should seek peace. We should seek calm. We want decency. We want order. We desire to see people from every nation, tribe, and tongue hungering and thirsting for the things of God instead of the lusts and desires of the world that keep people, what? Enslaved. Enslaved to sin. Uh, yes, there is something called the pleasure of sin for a season. Uh, sin is pleasurable. Otherwise, people wouldn't do it. But there are consequences. You know, you think about uh, the lusts of the world and, and what drives the world. What drives the world? Two things basically drive the world. Money and sex. That's what drives the world. And sin never satisfies, does it? It only brings bondage. You know, greed, the love of money, drugs. These things don't satisfy. They only leave a person wanting more. Promiscuity doesn't fulfill. It only leaves a person feeling more empty and alone. Pride it is only a facade because we're nothing more than dust here today and gone tomorrow. My friend, nothing in this world is able to fill the void in the human heart. Nothing, that is, except the Spirit of God. There is a, a quote that is attributed to St. Augustine, uh, Bishop of Hippo. He said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And these are the desires that God puts in the hearts of his people. This is what the Spirit of God brings. Comfort, righteousness, mercy. He says in verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And what is mercy? Mercy is the compassion and loving kindness of God given to people who are undeserving. And because God has been merciful to us when we don't deserve it, what should we do? We should be merciful to others. Think of all the grace and mercy God has given you. You should give that to others. And verse 8 is such a wonderful verse. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know, in Revelation 22, uh, verse 4, it talks about how in the new heaven and the new earth, we shall see God's face. And I don't know what that would look like, obviously. I, don't, I can't even imagine it. That's kind of the point. It's so amazing, so so glorious. And this is what? This is the ultimate reward of man. The first question in any catechism is what is the chief end of man? And what's the answer? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. I know we tend to think of eternal life as our reward, but really eternal life is not the gift. It is not the reward. Eternal life with God is the gift. Eternal life with God. God himself is our reward. What did the Lord tell Abraham in Genesis 15, 1? He said, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. God himself is the gift. Verses 44 and 45 further expand on verse 9, which says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called sons of God. Jesus says in verses 44 and 45, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So because God loves all men, God so loved the world, we should love others 
also. And we should seek peace with all men. Now the Beatitudes uh, come to an end and maybe an unexpected way. Things are a little different. You know, they start out, the first few statements of Christ uh, showed some lack, right? The poor in spirit, those who are mourning, uh, meekness, hungering, and thirsting. And then we see some more positive statements about uh, being merciful, and blessed are the pure in heart, and blessed are the peacemakers. And Christians want to be Filled. We want to receive mercy, certainly, and we want to show mercy. We desire peace. But what Jesus mentions next, not sure we want that. What does he say? What is he talking about? Persecution, being reviled, having people lie about you because of your faith in God and in his word. None of us want that. And you know what? There's a real simple way to avoid it. Just don't do anything for God. Just don't do anything for God. Don't speak up. Don't evangelize. Don't preach. Don't stand for what is right. Don't have any convictions, or if you do, uh, compromise them or don't ever say anything about them. That's a, a way to avoid adversity. You'll never receive any persecution if you don't live godly in Christ Jesus. But the Bible says all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So if you don't want this, just keep silent. Don't tell anyone about your faith. Don't have any convictions. Don't stand up for anything. Just do nothing for the Lord. But that's not an option, is it? Don't forget. Don't forget. In the scripture, when godly men and women stepped out in faith, there was a risk. There was always a risk. But was it worth it? You think about it, the parents of Moses, Moses' mother and his sister Miriam, when they hid the baby Moses, they were facing the wrath of Pharaoh. But was it worth it? When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow to the golden image or else be thrown into the fiery furnace, they were taking a great risk. But God protected them. When the apostles daily in the temple and in every house did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ, even with the threat of imprisonment, was it worth it? Yes, it was. So we will close with these statements of Christ in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Jesus said to them, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for showing us a more excellent way and Lord, give us the ability through your spirit that the Beatitudes would be our attitude as we seek to make the name of Christ known to all generations. We thank you and praise you for what you have done. We thank you and praise you for what you are going to do. And we ask it all in the precious name of Christ our Lord. Amen.